You know, no matter who else is taking off on the wave, this wave's out of sight, man. I'm going, you know. And you just start stroking, and it just starts building from the time you look at that wave to the time you stand up to the time you pull out. And even when you're paddling back out, you're just going, oh, out of sight, you know. And even when you watch somebody else ride away when you're paddling out, yeah. and you've just got an out of sight ride, you're just pumped, you know. It's just your heart's going like this, you know, and you're just stoked. You, you look out and you see another guy just locked in. He's way, way back inside the tube or he rips off a turn that's just unbelievable, you know? You get even more stoked, you know? You're just going, wow, how to slide. These waves are unreal, you know? Because you know that you've gotten stoked and then you're paddling out and you're watching somebody else get stoked. It just, it just, ah, stoke. it's a double stoke. Half a century ago, the world was a very different place than it is today. But few places were more different than the small state of Victoria nestled along the rocky southern coastline of the Australian mainland. So imagine when, in May 1970, more than 100 of the world's best surfers congregated between the small towns of Torquay and Lawn, which make up the ends of a starkly beautiful coastline that is now known as Victoria's Surf Coast. They came for the running of the fifth World Surfing Championships. You know, I've been down to Bell's Beach every Easter for the last, I suppose, eight years. Well, ever since, you know, ever since I hitchhiked down there when I was about 17, I hitchhiked down here and I stayed here for a couple of months and it was, it's a fantastic area. Australia was host to the 1970 World Surfing Championships. At the beginning of May, surfers from all over the world began to pour into Bell's Beach. They came from Hawaii in the States, South Africa and Japan, Puerto Rico and Peru, from every corner of the globe. Over 80 of the top world surfers were there. Champions like Corky Carroll from California, Peter Druin from Australia, Reno Abalera from Hawaii, the young US newcomer Rolf Arnes, who was to become the new world champion. Within days of the surfer's arrival, America's best-known competitor tells the wife of the Torquay publican to perform a physically impossible sexual act upon herself and is kicked off the team. The youngest member of the US team is busted for dope. The Hawaiian manager is kicked out of his hotel for allegedly having an underage girl in his room. And the Melbourne newspapers forget about Nixon's invasion of Cambodia and fill the front page with this surf scandal. Throughout the event, battle lines had been drawn, not between old school and new school, or functional versus involvement, but between the vertical staccato shortboarding of most of the Australians and the cleaner, longer lines drawn on the waves by the Hawaiians and Californians, particularly Rolf Arnes, who was the popular winner for both his skills in the water and his demeanour out of it. Surfing is really a, a, an art like any other art that contests try to make into a sport. Surfing really isn't a sport, it's an art. If nothing else, wrote New South Wales judge Jeff Luton, the championships managed to produce a unanimous world champion. And this, in itself, is quite an achievement. Ralph used uh, a tremendous amount of uh, weight knowledge, weight judgment, surfing ability, but he had long, direct lines, like a skier. He banked on each wave, went up to the top of them, would bank on them, and then drop down. 
and he his lines were clean and straight and I think that that that's Ralph it seems so laughably quaint today a bit of cursing some briefer a girl in a room but for a few days back then in another century and in the middle of nowhere it seemed surfing's future had shot itself in the foot and the damage might be permanent not that the World Surfing Championships hadn't seen bad behaviour before in its brief lifetime, but the Victorian frolics of 1970, an event that was never even meant to happen, was where the worlds collided. Ralph will represent the sport beautifully. First of all, he's young, and I think this was a young people's contest primarily. Number two, he represents to surfers something that they're very touchy about today, that is that he's not uh, purchasable. He can't be bought. He's not for sale. He throw his boat now to go back to the country of the winner, and he is supposed to take it to the next world tournament, and their names are being engraved in this uh, place. Uh, I often thought what it would be like to be champion, you know, and how, how great it would be, and, and all the fun and, and everything. But in order, and this has happened to me before, and like winning the first 4A contest I ever won at home. In order to be able to win, you've got to place yourself, you've got to put your, your mind in a position where you can't really enjoy it that much. Because if you're thinking how much you're going to enjoy it, or if you're loose enough to be able to have that much fun, then you're not going to win because it gets, it gets onto your nerves and into your head, and it doesn't work out that way. So you've got to make it so it's not a big thing. In order to win, you've got to say, well, this is just, it's not, it's just not a big thing. It's just nothing. Surfing in competition isn't going to be the rest of my life. And, uh, I plan to go to college and, and just start on a whole new world and completely different thing. Surfing has just been something through my youth that's carried through the competition part of it. Surfing, for surfing itself, which is an art, will always be always be in my life. I'll never be able to get away from that. I don't think anyone can. 